Greetings, what's up everyone? It's your soul and it's been a while dealing with the Steam hostile takeover of the Steam blockchain and uh, keeping up with all of the COVID-19 coronavirus changes as they uh, develop so that I can take the best action and help people who ask for help and so on. I wanted to take a few minutes here to go through links and data related to the coronavirus in general. I, I just haven't had time to do this and there's been so much information uh, coming through to me through the web, which I wanted to share. And I know that a lot of people have seen it, but still probably most people haven't seen most of this information. So, and it's very important, I think, to understand this, to put the messages that are coming through from the media and governments of the world into the proper context, uh, or at least to provide some alternative narrative to what's being said. With that in mind, I would also like to point out that I am certainly not trained in any biological chemical, toxicological, or any medical field to a professional level. My training is in systems engineering. Uh, so when I look through these, well, when I help you look through these uh, scientific papers I'm going to bring up, bear that in mind. I'm not saying I fully understand everything that's in these papers. I definitely don't. But I am taking references and comments from people who are specialists in this field. Um, and they don't all agree, for sure. So Basically, do your own research, make up your own mind. Really, I'm just drawing your attention to the fact that these documents exist more than anything else. And I'm happy to receive comments from anyone who might be an expert in these fields uh, to add in information or to contradict what I'm saying uh, and to fill in the gaps. And that's one of the great things about the internet is that we can do that. And that's one of the reasons why I post. So please do, if you're a specialist in any of these related fields, then let us know your thoughts. So we're looking here at Bing's tracking map for COVID-19. It's dubious as to how accurate this data is, but obviously, you know, it's not going to be 100% accurate, but it's kind of the best we have, as far as I'm aware, online anyway. Uh, and as you can see, as of today, middle of March, we're seeing here uh, in China, stated 8,940 8, active cases, uh, 68,715 recovered cases, 3,226 fatal cases. So I know there's a lot of claims and material coming up, China claiming that actually the body count is much higher than that and they've been cremating bodies non-stop in some areas uh, and really the government had covered up the extent of it. That's quite important as we go forward, tracking the potential development of the disease in other countries because really China is the main template we have to monitor or model the likely pattern of the diseases spreads. So if their data is inaccurate and misleading, then all the other data and projections could be wildly wrong as well. That's something to bear in mind. Currently, after China, Italy and Iran are the next highest in the list, with Spain coming down uh, next. Uh, there's a few, few different viewpoints as to why Iran, you know, particularly uh, had a high incidence of the disease. Some people speculating that perhaps this was a, a DNA-targeted weapon against China and um, Iran, I've posted previously a video from 2010 uh, from the Project Camelot group, which showed that they were talking back in 2010 that a whistleblower had stated to them that a DNA-targeted flu uh, virus was going to be used on China in the near future as part of a wider political plan by various covert groups. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that's definitely what's going on here, but it's interesting that the description given to Bill Ryan there was almost identical to what's happening. And, it, you know, it wasn't like, oh, it's going to be a certain type of virus and it's going to be Hong Kong or Australia or wherever. It was, no, it's going to be flu virus in China. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, the image that was portrayed through that testimony uh, seemed to be that they were saying that this was being done as a way to create economic downturn, which this group would then take advantage of uh, through a variety of means which weren't fully disclosed. That was actually a Freemasonry group that claimed by that whistleblower, uh, was behind this. So, you know, don't have any more info on that, but let's just keep going, because there's a ton of interesting information here. Uh, another interesting point that was raised uh, by commenters in the Discord for Steam recently was that Italy and Iran both have a culture of body contact. Iran has a, a custom of triple kissing on the face, I think, as I understand, um, and Italy also very kind of, you know, kissy, kind of huggy type of culture. Um, so that could be part of why it's being transmitted so um, so much more in those nations compared to other areas. Something to bear in mind. 
So, next link, which I just came across today uh, from the 13th of March, Denmark, emergency coronavirus laws. Basically saying here that although, like most countries, they're talking here about having some sort of enforced quarantine rules and laws, we have that here in Britain, uh, they are going one step further here and basically saying the law allow also allows the authorities to force people to be vaccinated even though there is currently no vaccination for the virus. Now, this goes against medical ethics. It goes against the entire basis of numerous human rights and the entire ethical foundation of medicine, full stop. Um, medicine is to be consensual, not to be forced. So this is a major red flag, and it's exactly the kind of red flag that countless people have been warning against coming down the line for many years. Um, looking at the way that these groups operate to create problems, engineer them, and then when the world reaches its arms up in despair for a solution, they get to introduce their solution, which was the solution they wanted to introduce all along, a problem-reaction solution. Why would they want to introduce forced vaccinations? Well, vaccinations are one of the only ways that allow biological control over a human being, um, ultimately, uh, from the inside out. So to get certain agents and even technology inside people requires a degree of voluntary agreement on their part, usually. Um, so, you know, if people, they know that ultimately these groups who are quite nefarious, I would say in nature, many of them, um, they know that most people are not going to accept certain vaccinations uh, or once these vaccinations are examined, then certainly they'll reject them when they know what's in them. Uh, most people, I think, would reject most vaccinations if they knew what was actually in them. They don't usually take the time to examine the contents. Um, anything from aluminium, mercury, through to various viruses, fetal cells. This, it's just stuff that does not belong in a person's bloodstream, full stop. Uh, so anyway, um, I think this is quite alarming. This is the only country I've heard talking about doing this. Uh, and as yet, there is no vaccination for the virus, so they aren't actually doing this. But... You can take it that this essentially means that if a virus, uh, vaccine for the virus were to be generated in the next week, you may see forced vaccinations in Denmark, which literally means presumably police and military with guns forcing people to be vaccinated. So this is serious. This is very unsettling to me and completely unethical. And, uh, you know, I, I would say the threat generated by the, such a... Uh, um, an overriding of free will is more significant than any threat posed by this virus for many reasons. Uh, that's a subject that deserves its own, its own post and video on its own, but I'm going to keep moving. So coming on here to some posts which, uh, or some studies, scientific studies, which have been highlighted by various people, including a guy called Dr. Francis Boyle, who I'm going to start show you some clips of in a moment. Uh, it seems that essentially... There has been scientific research being done um, between the University of Maryland in America and various places in China as well for a number of years uh, where they've deliberately taken coronavirus uh, variants from bats and then deliberately amplified their effectiveness or their danger level, let's say, in the laboratory, uh, in, in labs across China, as I understand it. And in some cases, actually made a new form of virus, a chimera virus, which includes HIV pseudovirus components. So they've essentially taken some of the mechanisms from HIV, combined it with SARS viruses, um, and created something new that's potentially far more dangerous. And, you know, this isn't really part of the mainstream narrative. <laughs> you would think, or I would think, in a, in a sane and honest world, it would be, um, but it's not. However, uh, if you read through this paper... It basically does describe that. Like I said, I'm not an expert in this subject. There's a numerous technical phrases in here that I don't understand. I'm not going to claim that I know everything about this. I'm totally open to specialists coming in and saying, well, yeah, I can see why you're concerned, but this isn't what's happening because X, Y, Z. As yet, I haven't seen that, and we'll get on to what has been put out in, in rebuttal to the claims that this is evidence of the engineering of this virus. Uh, they're not very convincing. Um, interestingly, as I was reading through this, uh, I saw this phrase in here. Uh, the infection was monitored by measuring the luciferase activity, which kind of made me jump a little bit because uh, for those who... I'm not religious, I'm not Christian, uh, but I do understand that luciferianism is a thing and there are people who worship, worship Lucifer generally a bit messed up in the head. Uh, looking up luciferase uh, in Wikipedia, it's actually uh, an element that's used to create 
uh, phosphorus type glowing effects and used in laboratories. So not necessarily anything nefarious there, but an interesting synchronicity anyway. Um, so I highly suggest people take a look through this paper and uh, but, we're, but you know, in a sense, really, I would suggest you listen to Dr. Francis Boyle, who I'm going to bring around in a moment. So this is a paper that was, or uh, an article, I guess, that was published in Nature, so-called prestigious Journal of Science. Um, and this was put out in 2015. And I'm going to read you the editor's note that was added recently, this month, in a moment. But let's just see what was said in here. An experiment that created a hybrid version of a bat coronavirus one related to the virus that causes SARS, has triggered renewed debate over whether engineering lab variants of viruses with possible pandemic potential is worth the risks. In an article published in Nature Medicine on 9th of November, scientists investigated a virus called SHC014, which is found in horseshoe bats in China. The researchers created a chimeric virus made up of a surface protein of SCH014 and the backbone of a SARS virus that had been adapted to grow in mice and to mimic human disease. The chimera infected human airway cells, proving that the surface protein of SHC014 has the necessary structure to bind to a key receptor on the cells and to infect them. It also caused disease in mice but did not kill them. Although almost all coronaviruses isolated from bats have not been able to bind to the key human receptor, SHC014 is not the first that can do so. In 2013, researchers reported this ability for the first time in a different coronavirus isolated from the same bat population. The findings reinforce suspicions that bat coronaviruses capable of directly infecting humans rather than first needing to evolve in an intermediate animal host may be more common than previously thought, the researchers say. But other virologists question whether the information gleaned from the experiment justifies the potential risk. Although the extent of any risk is difficult to assess, Simon Wayne Hobson, a virologist at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, points out that researchers have created a novel virus that grows remarkably well in human cells. If the virus escaped, nobody could predict the trajectory, he says. The argument is essentially a rerun of the debate over whether to allow lab research that increases the virulence, ease of spread or host range of dangerous pathogens, what is known as gain-of-function research. In October 2014, the US government imposed a moratorium on federal funding of such research on the viruses that cause SARS, influenza and MERS. The latest study was already underway before the US moratorium began and the U.S. National Institute of Health allowed it to proceed while it was under review by the agency, says Ralph Barrick, an infectious disease researcher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a co-author of the study. The NIH eventually concluded that the work was not so risky as to fall under the moratorium, he said. But Wayne Hobson disapproves of the study because he says it provides little benefit and reveals little about the risk that the wild SCHC014 virus in bats poses to humans. Other experiments in the study show that the virus in wild bats would need to evolve to pose any threat to humans, a change that may never happen, although it cannot be ruled out. Barrett and his team reconstructed the wild virus from its genome sequence and found that it grew poorly in human cell cultures and caused no significant disease in mice. The only impact of this work is the creation in the lab of a new non-natural risk, agrees Richard Ebright, a molecular biologist and biodefense expert at Rutgers University in Piscataway, New Jersey. Both Ebright and Wayne Hobson and are long-standing critics of gain-of-function research. In their paper, the study authors also concede that funders may think twice about allowing such experiments in the future. Scientific review panels may deem similar studies building chimeric viruses based on circulating strains too risky to pursue, they write, adding that discussion is needed as to whether these types of chimeric virus studies warrant further investigation versus the inherent risks involved. So... The summary of all of this is basically certain experts in the field say that this research is extremely dangerous and those involved in it say, well, it's not so bad. And they've effectively really broken um, US government decision on this kind of research, but which declared that it shouldn't be done, but only because it was started briefly before they decided to do that. So this is one that kind of... Uh, slip through the net, let's say, of decision-making in government. And the description of what they've done here is remarkably similar to what we're seeing in this um, potential pandemic, in the sense that it's already been shown that HIV drugs, some of them are, can be used to treat this virus. Now, why would that be? I mean, again, I'm absolutely not an expert in this, but if you've got studies here saying, showing, proving that these people were combining uh, SARS with 
HIV type uh, content, then is it really so uh, much too much of a stretch of the imagination to say, well, maybe the reason the HIV drugs work on this is because this has an HIV type component to it, this new iteration of the virus. And other than that, I mean, the new virus does seem to be remarkably similar to SARS. So, you know, if this was all there was to go on, then it would be concerning. But, you know, there's a lot of gaps here, a lot of uncertainty. Now, it's interesting to note that Nature here published this addendum or this extra comment from the editor recently. We are aware that this story is being used as the basis for unverified theories that the novel coronavirus caused, causing COVID-19 was engineered. There is no evidence that this is true. Scientists believe that an animal is the most likely source of the coronavirus. Well, I find this to be a red flag, the phrasing of this sentence, for a start. Um, when they say scientists believe, first of all, they have not named the scientists. Secondly, there are large numbers of scientists in the world. So just because some scientists believe something doesn't mean to say that anyone else agrees with them. This is not how science works. You don't simply just refute a claim because you say, well, scientists believe this. That's not how science works. You, you know, you don't. You just don't do that. You know, you should at least be saying, well, we accept that there's a possibility of this based on the evidence. And the evidence is this research was done. Other research was done similar to this. And there's more evidence uh, tying all of this together as well. Um, so if we move on to this page here, which is from ResearchGate, this was a, a document that was published on ResearchGate and then retracted or removed. And it was from a guy here in South China University of Technology. So, um, Joint International Research Laboratory of Synthetic Biology and Medicine, School of Biology and Biological Engineering, um, and School of Physics, and from a hospital in Wuhan. So there are basically, I think, two authors here who have worked together, uh, and they're tied into these organizations. And this is only very short, so I'm going to read it. It's all extremely important. The 2019 NCOV coronavirus has caused an epidemic of 28,060 laboratory confirmed infections in humans, including 564 deaths in China by February 6, 2020. Two descriptions of the virus published on Nature this week indicated that the genome sequences from patients were 96 or 89 percent identical to the bat COV ZC45 coronavirus originally found in Rhinolophus affinis, which is a bat. It was critical to study where the pathogen came from and how it passed on to humans. An article published on the Lancet reported that 41 people in Wuhan were found to have the acute respiratory syndrome and 27 of them had con contact with the Huanan seafood market. The 2019 NCOV was found in 33 out of the 585 samples collected in the market after the outbreak. The market was suspected to be the origin of the epidemic and was shut down according to the rule of quarantine um, and so on. The English in here isn't perfect, but hey, no problem, my Chinese is not great. The bats carrying COV ZC45 were originally found in Yunnan and Zhejiang province, both of which were more than 900 kilometers away from the seafood market. Bats were normally found to live in caves and trees, but the seafood market is a densely populated district of Wuhan, a metro metropolitan area of 15 million people. The probability was very low for the bats to fly to the market. According to municipal reports and the testimonies of 31 residents and 28 visitors, bat was never a food source in the city. No bat was traded in the market. There was possible natural recombination or intermediate host of the coronavirus, yet little proof has been reported. So this is what nature uh, was essentially saying here. Um, scientists believe that animal is the most likely source. So they're basically pointing out, you know, this story that bats, people ate bats and they got it from that. And then, uh, well, no, apparently that's not the case. So... Um, all right, well, the next likely theory is that there was an intermediate animal host that people let, presumably, but as he says here, little proof has been reported, meaning no proof has been reported. Was there any other possible pathway? We screened the area around the seafood market and identified two laboratories conducting research on bat coronavirus. Within 280 metres from the market, there was the Wuhan Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, which we can see on a map down here. So this is the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention. Walk up this road, cross a main road, and you're at the Huanan Seafood Market. So very nearby, absolutely very nearby. And you can totally imagine somebody working um, in the disease centre, walking home, perhaps to a train or getting some food on the way home, having the virus and spreading it out to people. 
WHCDC hosted animals in laboratories for research purposes, one of which was specialised in pathogens collection and identification. In one of the studies, 155 bats, including Rhinolophus affinis, were captured in Huabei uh, province, and, other four, and another 450 bats were captured in Zhejiang province. The expert in collection was noted in the author contributions. Moreover, he was broadcasted for collecting viruses on nationwide newspapers and websites in 2017-2019. So you can actually look down and see mainstream media stories on this work being done. He described that he was once attacked by bats and the blood of a bat shot on his skin. He knew the extreme danger of the infection, so he quarantined himself for 14 days. In another accident, he quarantined himself again because bats peed on him. He was once thrilled for capturing a bat carrying a live tick. Surgery was performed on the caged animals and the tissue samples were collected for DNA and RNA extraction and sequencing. Tissue samples and contaminated trashes were, sources, were a source of pathogens. They're only 280 metres from the seafood market. The WHCDC was also adjacent to the Union Hospital, where the first group of doctors were infected during this epidemic. It is plausible that the virus leaked around and some of them contaminated the initial patients in this epidemic, though solid proofs are needed in future study. The second laboratory was 12 kilometres from the seafood market and belonged to Wuhan Institute of Virology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. This laboratory reported that the Chinese horseshoe bats were natural reservoirs for the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, which caused the 2002-2003 pandemic. The principal investigator participated in a project which generated a chimeric virus using the SARS-CoV reverse genetic system and reported the potential for human emergence. A direct speculation was that SARS-CoV or its derivative might leak from the laboratory. In summary, somebody was entangled with the evolution of 2019 NCOV coronavirus. In addition to origins of natural recombination and intermediate host, the killer coronavirus probably originated from a laboratory in Wuhan. Safety level may need to be reinforced in high-risk, biohazardous laboratories. Regulations may be taken to relocate these laboratories far away from city centre and other densely populated places. So this guy really, or I think it's a guy and a woman potentially, have done, I would say, quite good work here and yes they accept that they don't know all the answers but they have done their due diligence and passed on this information to the world this paper was removed from the website quite quickly and i do not know what's happened to these people which chance that they've gone into quite a lot of trouble in china for this but i don't know so this brings us on to francis boyle and i'm going to play you a few clips from this he's going to introduce himself and we'll listen to some of what he has to say i'll leave the link to the rest of this video underneath there's other videos from him going into more detail but this is a more recent one. It's the most recent one I've seen. It's from uh, March 8th, and it's with Dr. McCullough, who's quite well respected online, despite having been heavily censored by Google and so on, for having a few points that go against the mainstream narrative. So let's check out what he has to say. Welcome, everyone. This is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health. And today we are joined by Francis Boyle, who is uh, really has quite the pedigree. He uh, had his undergraduate training at the University of Chicago and got his a JD lawyer degree from Harvard and also a PhD in political science. And uh, he's been quite active in the uh, protection environment from the U.S. government and their, their crea creative strategies for, for bioweapons. And specifically, we're talking about coronavirus today. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Dr. Uh, Mercola, and my best to your viewing audience. All right, so uh, the coronavirus um, is a virus that uh, seems to have come from Wuhan. And if you're like me, most of the people in the US have probably never heard of Wuhan before, but it's a pretty big city. It's bigger than New York City. There's 11 million people in this city. Uh, so obviously China is a large country with over a billion people, but it's still a large metropolis. It's not some rural urban farming community. So it's affected over 50,000 people in China as we're recording this in February, February 14th. So I'm sure it's going to be more by the time this podcast airs. And um, I'm wondering if you could provide us with your speculations as to how this uh, apparently engineered virus uh, was produced and how it came to be out of uh, Wuhan. Because it wasn't due to bat soup. We know that's for sure. No, oh, that's uh, Chinese propaganda for sure. Uh, well, let me back up a little. I was the one who uh, called for 
uh, U.S. domestic implementing legislation for the Biological Weapons Convention of 1972 and drafted it, known as the uh, Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989 that was passed unanimously by both houses of the United States Congress and signed into law by uh, President George Bush Sr. So as a result of this uh, uh, anti-biological warfare work going back to the uh, early days of the uh, Reagan administration that was using DNA genetic engineering uh, to manufacture uh, biological weapons, uh, I have been uh, observing mysterious outbreaks of uh, disease for both humans and animals uh, around the world since then. Indeed, my Biowarfare uh, Anti-Terrorism Act was specifically designed also not only to deal with regular biological weapons, but also with uh, DNA genetic engineering for uh, biological weapons that was uh, just coming into its infancy when the BWC was being drafted. And even though uh, the BWC would, would cover uh, uh, DNA genetic engineering, I wanted to make it clear that, that by name that it was covered. And I also uh, made it clear it covered synthetic uh, biology as well. That was in there uh, too. So when these unexplained mysterious uh, illnesses break out, I monitor for them a while. Usually I, I just conclude they can be explained by normal reasons, uh, lack of sanitation, poverty, you know, things of that nature. But in uh, Wuhan, it, it seemed pretty suspicious to me. And uh, there is this biosafety level four uh, facility there in Wuhan. It's the first uh, in China. It was specifically set up to deal with uh, the coronavirus and SARS. SARS is basically a weaponized version of the uh, uh, coronavirus. There have been leaks before of SARS uh, out of this uh, facility. And indeed, uh, the only reason for these BSL-4 facilities, based on my experience, is the research, development, testing, and stockpiling of uh, offensive biological uh, weapons. So for that reason, I stated my opinion that uh, this Wuhan uh, coronavirus uh, leaked out of that um, BSL-4 facility. The first reported case was December 1. So if it depends what the incubation uh, period is. Uh, the official party line is 14 days. A British health expert has said he believes it's 24 days. Uh, North Korea is taking the position it's 30 days. They have their own biological warfare experts there. So it seems to me there was, there was a, a leak at this uh, facility, maybe mid-November. Uh, it was reported up the line, and uh, the Chinese government has been uh, lying about it and covering up uh, ever since. And uh, as for uh, 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 Wuhan and the Hubei province, sure, they're basically under martial law. There's no other word for it. If you read even the statements by President Xi and his uh, assistants, they've made it cl very clear they're at war here. And that is correct. They're at war with a, uh, uh, bio their own biological warfare uh, agent. Uh, President Xi just fired the uh, party apparatchiks uh, in charge of this and have brought in uh, trusted uh, military personnel uh, to, to handle it, as well as large numbers of uh, uh, PLA uh, forces say, well, they're healthcare workers. They don't look like healthcare workers to me. So, um, uh, as it's as of now, that's my best reading of the situation, Doctor. So it, it appears at least there's some stories that are out there that suggest that the uh, coronavirus originally was uh, stolen from a, a lab in Canada in Winnipeg and then brought into China at this BSL-4 facility in Wuhan. Do you have any thoughts on that? It could have been. I mean, I want to make it clear that, uh, in my opinion, they were already working on that 
mm -hmm. uh, at, at that Wuhan BSL-4 facility. They were working on a, uh, a biological warfare uh, weapon involving uh, SARS, which, as I said, is a um, coronavirus to begin with. We do know that this uh, Dr. Mengele uh, Karakawa up at the University of Wisconsin, uh, he's now in Japan, I guess, uh, which is due north of me, uh, he resurrected the Spanish flu virus for the Pentagon, obviously for weapons purposes. And he specializes in uh, uh, mating the Spanish flu virus to all sorts of hideous uh, biowarfare uh, instrumentalities. And there was also a record then of him shipping uh, his products up to uh, Winnipeg. Uh, Winnipeg is uh, Canada's equivalent of our own uh, Fort Detrick. It's a BSL-4 facility. And yes, uh, they research, develop, develop test, uh, manufacture, stockpile, every type of hideous uh, biological warfare weapon that we know of. So some of this technology could have been uh, stolen from Winnipeg. Uh, I don't know about that, but as I said, uh, the Wuhan BSL-4 was, was already working on this to begin with. They had already developed SARS. SARS had uh, uh, leaked already before, two to, three, four time, two to three times before this. And it seems that they were uh, uh, turbocharging uh, SARS, which that, that's what this looks uh, to be the case. This is a brand new uh, generation of um, uh, biowarfare uh, weapons uh, we haven't seen before. Uh, its lethality goes from uh, 15 percent, uh, as estimated by Lancet, up to uh, 17 to 18 percent by a, uh, a British health official and even Chinese uh, statistics. Its infectivity is 83 uh, percent. It can affect uh, maybe uh, three to four people for every, every person uh, infected. It has gain-of-function properties which means it, it travels through air uh, at least six or uh, seven feet. Uh, and it does appear now there are reports that even uh, contaminated human feces uh, give it off, that it, the human feces radiate off maybe six or seven feet. So we've, we've never seen anything like this before uh, in, in the history of biological warfare, at least in the public record. I, I want to make it clear, Doctor, I have never worked for the United States government. I, I've never had a security uh, clearance. I've never had access to any type of uh, secret information. I just read what is in the public record and the scientific record and, and try, try to draw my own conclusions. And, and that's what I'm giving you today. I, I could change my opinion if um, uh, people can provide me uh, reputable scientific uh, evidence to the contrary. I've, I've made this plea, plea before. Uh, people will send me things that don't look very convincing. So right now I'm standing with standing by my conclusion that it, it leaked out of the uh, Wuhan BSL-4. Uh, uh, the highest level of the Chinese government has known about it. Uh, they've been covering it up from the get-go until they uh, informed the WHO at the end of December. So, I'll leave the link for this video under under this one, so you can check out the rest of this. And, uh, you know, he's a very interesting person to listen to. And I think it's important for everybody to take in multiple different angles on all this, especially when we have, you know, this kind of enforced vaccination situation being presented. And we have a whistleblower from 2010 stating that this was a plan. All along, um, I it just saddens me really that there are so many people calling, falling right into the playbook of these people. Quite likely, a playbook of problem, reaction, solution. Um, not understanding that they're being manipulated. Quite likely, even if this virus was released as an accident, even if it wasn't even engineered, these entities and groups are just waiting for a moment like this to be able to. Uh, enact certain control agendas which give them uh, a domination ability over the populations of the world for various reasons. Uh, I think centralization is always a problem. The problems that we've seen on the Steam blockchain that have made it into mainstream media 
lately as a result of, ironically, someone from Wuhan, Justin Sun, um, taking control of the Steam blockchain and centralizing it. And that's just one example of how centralization is a huge problem. And, and this kind of enforced vaccination situation is another example of why um, centralization is a problem. Uh, decentralization allows for free will. It allows for each individual to take responsibility. People claiming that we should take responsibility by giving in to doing exactly what we're told don't understand what personal responsibility and free will actually are. And they're actually quite dangerous, um, in my opinion. So... Yes, it is necessary in some cases for people to be isolated or to isolate themselves away from other people to prevent people getting ill, to slow down the spread of disease and so on. Uh, however, when you give in to allowing a group of people to use force and violence to enact that process, it opens the door to such a massive potential for harm to be done by people involved in that that it, it's just it's terrifying to me. Um, in China and, and anywhere, really, it's the perfect opportunity for political dissent to be s silenced. You know, there are lots of um, uh, strong political movements in China and elsewhere in their sort of empire uh, against the government. And then all of a sudden that was all stopped in the blink of an eye as soon as this epidemic uh, broke out, which I think is also suspect. Um, and I think that ultimately... If you're a dissenter against the voice of an authoritative authoritarian regime, then a lockdown of this kind is exactly the perfect tool that they would want to use to basically murder you and get rid of you. And I've also reported previously on the Falun Gong movement in China, uh, where there was a whistleblower doctor who testified that he had been forced by the government there to murder innocent people um, who had been falsely accused of crimes in order to extract organs to be used as or for organ harvesting on a large scale. So, you know, I mean, I can't say for certain that's 100% true, but we've seen a whistleblower basically admitting to murder uh, from China. We've seen numerous other people claiming this is going on. So I would not in any way be surprised if this was real and the government over there were doing extremely evil things uh, on a level with Nazi Germany and, and other such groups throughout history. So given that that's seems likely it's in no way a stretch of my imagination to believe that they have or to accept the possibility that they have engineered this situation for their own benefit so yeah i mean what do we do with all of this information well firstly be skeptical question everything don't just blindly accept what you're told because it's for your own good especially if it means being forcibly injected with something um or you know forced to lose your liberty or something like that um question everything and do your best to be self-empowered learn about your own immunity how to modulate your own immune system how to build your own immune system with correct nutrition sunlight fresh air exercise uh all these things that we need to be doing anyway whether there's an epidemic or not that very few people seem to really be doing they're all very potent and powerful and uh you know dramatically increase your chance of surviving any transmittable disease and probably this one too so as always fruit and veg <laughs> um, make good choices stay healthy and look out for each other and uh, don't let yourself be overrun by fear or um, pushed around by people who you've been taught to believe are authorities and experts who when you check the validity of the statements often turns out they actually aren't really they're not really using the scientific process as it should be used um, but you know if you tell a lie enough times then enough people believe it becomes the truth doesn't it in people's minds and that's apparently what these groups rely on I'm not saying that any one specific thing that they've said is a lie i'm just saying that they are known liars and we need to be very cautious about what they say and, and what happens as a result of what they say anyway i've gone on for quite a while here and uh please let, as i said at the start of the video please let me know any comments you might have on this any extra info that i might have missed and uh, thanks for listening. Uh, please do give this an up vote, a thumbs up, subscribe and so on. Uh, if you haven't already, if you like the content here. And uh, until next time, peace.